Okay, thank you. We're going to begin with a little uh, motivation meditation, as we always do. Ah, so sit comfortably, relax your body and mind. Place your attention on your breathing, respiration. And then place your mindfulness on that which you have recognized. To the exclusion of everything else. Besides focusing the mind and letting go of other ideation, other conceptualizing thoughts, watching the breathing can bring about insights. What goes up must come down, like Bitcoin. As your mind becomes calmer, the breathing becomes more regular and less pronounced, more shallow. Once you've found a little bit of calmness, bring your attention, take your attention away from the breathing, place it instead on the observation of the mental consciousness. See if you can recall, bring back a remembering consciousness of the clear light nature of the mind. If not, reconstruct it. The mind is not obscuring, not obstructing. Withdrawing your attention away from the various thoughts or mental states Place it instead on just the clear light, conventional clear light nature. If 
maybe like feeling someone who's has had financial problems suddenly having found an inheritance of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, the relief thinking, I can do anything now, knowing that our mind has this quality, conventional quality. Besides being an object of concentration, it can bring the insight that we can make use of this life of leisure and endowment that we have that is so fragile and impermanent, definitely finishing with every instant. We can use it to definitely develop virtuous qualities that we had heretofore never believed that we could develop. We can also overcome our faults, our selfishness, our pride, our jealousy, our anger, our attachment. Especially recalling the great aims of the life of leisure and endowment that we can achieve liberation or enlightenment as a result of it. And taking to mind that all living beings have been intimately related with this, depthlessly kind since beginning this time. They're exactly equal with us in wanting to be endowed with happiness and wanting to be free of suffering, never finding any satisfaction in the happiness that we do have. With a sense of empathy and responsibility toward all living beings like that, that we have for our moms and dads. I think it would be unconsciousable to achieve enlightenment or liberation, let's say, for my own sake alone, while my mothers remain unguided under the influence of the waves of karma and delusion. The best way to lead them out of cyclic existence into everlasting happiness is for ourself to achieve that state with the intention thereby of leading all sentient beings perfectly out of suffering and placing them into everlasting bliss of enlightenment, to do so effortlessly, spontaneously, without error, that would be my greatest gift to my mothers To do that, we have to know the mind, to be able to conquer the faults and, and develop virtuous qualities. Thinking in that way, motivate that I'm going to participate this morning and the rest of my life and future lives with the intention of achieving enlightenment for the sake of sentient beings. Sometimes practicing patience so as not to degenerate my collection of virtue, abstaining from negative actions, creating virtuous actions, benefiting sentient beings. 
particular this morning, I'm going to listen, contemplate, and meditate on the material on the mind and mental factors with the ultimate purpose of achieving enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. And bringing your attention back to the present. Many of the great lamas, before they begin uh, discourses, of course, there's an, a period of accumulation of merit, maybe doing puja, you know, the guru puja or <clears throat> some kind of ritual, reciting uh, prayers, making offerings to the Buddhas and so forth, confessing our negativities, rejoicing, the seven limb puja and so forth. Kind of implicit in what our, our meditation at the beginning, although we could do more. So when you do begin practice, just having recalled this kind of meditation that we've done many, many times now, you know, that's a good way to begin your meditation, to develop the motivation of bodhicitta by recalling you know, the, the opportunity that we have, the fragility of life, impermanence, and so forth. So very, very important. I wanted to mention, uh, I think I've mentioned it other times, the, when I was at Instituto Lama Sunkapa, what was it, I-L-T-K, <laughs> as, as, uh, as uh, Doris was mentioning earlier. Uh, Ugeshi Jambigatso, who I had taught English to when he was at Copan in the early years, and he was the, the Geshe there. Uh, Geshe would mention that in the Laramba class, when the Geshe's were, uh, even when they'd, they'd received their Geshe's, after they'd received the Laramba Geshe, you know, the, the, the very learned ones who were also practitioners, it wasn't that they were only scholars. When they met together, they would discuss all the topics of Abhidharma and Pramana Vartaka and the Lamrim and Majamaka and the Prajnaparamita. Uh, they would ask each other questions. And uh, so it was something that was very, very alive with them. So I hope you, when you meet one another, you know, when you listen to the teachings again, the, these hours that we spent together and your many hours of study and research and so forth and contemplation uh, will put you in a similar kind of situation. When I was at Copan uh, in the early years, in the seventies, there was a, a Geshe there who became the abbot eventually, Geshe uh, Lama Lundup. He was, get, he, was get, he was granted a Geshe degree later. He was just Lama Lundup at the time. Uh, and he took care of the boys, their education, and uh, also daily activities, you know, making sure the food was there and so forth. And uh, I visited his room one time with Lama Yeshe when, when Lama Lundup was somewhere else. And, the, the room was a mess and there were texts all over the place and uh, you know and so forth and I and I and I <laughs> I don't know what I, I said something and Lama said this is because uh, Geshe-la you know Lama Lundup has uh, all of these responsibilities but also because he spends his time reading the texts you know there are all these texts around maybe like Bob's room you know Bob's, Bob's are well closed and put in the shelves, but maybe in some other part of his room, he's got open books uh, that he would go from one to another, always studying, even though he had you know, finished his education. Uh, so that's very, very important to know. 
as I mentioned, I teased Shanka, who is not able to come this morning. He said he'll come to the next class. I said that Sakya Pandita said that even until the day you die, it's incredibly worthwhile to study. You know, uh, one of the one of the teachers who I had uh, very close guidance from over the years in Dharamsala, who had been the abbot of the of the Dalai Lama's monastery. Um, when he when he gave me teachings on Mahamudra and some other texts, he would say it was very important to leave imprints. You know, you know, whatever you do, read this, study this, think about it, leaving imprints for future lives, so that when you encounter this material again, once you're born as a human, uh, you will be, you know, it will it will resonate with you you will be able to go much deeper than you are now. It's like painting the wall, you know, with a primer coat right now that is imprints in our mind. That primer coat, coat will <laughs> remain into future lives. Uh, and uh, with your prayers now to again, be born as a human and encounter the Dharma and so forth to benefit sentient beings. As you hear the teachings, you can go much deeper. I wanted to share that, that with you. So yeah, so how are we doing? Any questions from our previous classes? We're doing okay. So we're on the, the section of, of the 51 mental factors. Uh, of the 51 mental factors, we've talked about the five omnipresent, the five object ascertaining, the 11 virtuous, and now we're on the section of the uh, six root afflictions. Of, of the six, the first five are called non-views, and the sixth are called afflicted views. Um, and now we're, we were talking on, uh, we've, we've mentioned the first, we've gone over the view of the transitory collection and uh, the various ways of thinking about it from the low, you know, he, the, say, Satrantika or Vibhashika point of view, uh, that it is, uh, well, say, of the views, the, the views in general, the difference between non-view and view is a view is something that is a misdirected or afflicted wisdom. Right uh, from the lower point, lower schools. When you talk about the first non-views, including ignorance, that seems to be uh, not a misdirected wisdom. It's kind of like more of a obscuration of mind or not knowing. But in the Mahayana, and in particular, uh, the Chittimatra and Majamaka. It's accepted that even marikpa, unknowing or ignorance, is also a, a, a wisdom that has uh, misunderstood something. Remember when we talked about the, the mental factors? Usually, we think of wisdom as a, a a good a good thing, right? Generally, it's a good thing if you use it, but you could use it to how to, you know to figure out how to win an election that you didn't win, you know, how to take control, or you can use it to make money illegally and so forth, um, how to make poison and bombs. Or you can just have a misdirected wisdom as a result of which you hold these wrong views. So we talked about the, the view of the transitory collection, jik sok latawa. Jik means kind of transitory. Sok means collection transitory collection, meaning the aggregates. Now, the second one, the view holding to extreme, tarta. I think I'd just begun this last time, right? So um, the Abhidhamma Samuchaya, the text by As Asanga right, says, what is the view holding to an extreme? Uh, and the answer is, it. It is any endurance, desire, intelligence, conception, or view which views the five appropriated aggregates 
as being either permanent or annihilated. It has the function of hindering definite emergence. Definite emergence means, uh, you know, real renunciation and eventually emerging from cyclic existence. But definite emergence, nijong, just usually means just renunciation. The function of hindering renunciation by means of the middle path. So what's the idea here? Um, when you would, if you were to hold that the egg, that the person, I say the five, is it the, which views the five appropriated aggregates as being either permanent or annihilated. So again, there's probably a little bit difference between the lower tenets and the Prasangika. The Prasangika would say, which holds the person rather than the appropriated aggregate, holds the person to be annihilated at death. So thinking, when you're dead, you're gone. That's very common in the world, right? People say, because I wouldn't say the majority of people in the world believe in reincarnation. Maybe they, they have some kind of Christian or, or uh, you know, belief or belief for the peoples of the book that you'll be born in heaven or some other place later but they don't usually talk, most people don't believe in rein, reincarnation. So they, many, and, and of those, um, many people believe at the time of death, the, you just, you're gone. Your body, your, obviously your aggregates are gone, your consciousness and your, uh, your body are no longer associated with you. They're no longer connected. Here it says any, endurance, desire, intelligence, conception, or view, which views the five appropriated aggregates as being either permanent or annihilated. So the annihilated would be an extreme view. Like when you die, uh, there's no coming back. From a Prasangika point of view, I think it would be that the person is annihilated at the time of death, that uh, this, is, this is a wrong view, an extreme view. The counterpart of that, which is the other extreme, is thinking that the person or the aggregates continue after death. Um, you know, you might say, well, doesn't Buddha, Buddhism subscribe to that? Doesn't Buddhism subscribe to the person existing after death? What do you think, Doris? Can you say it again? <laughs> I lost it. Yeah. So you, you got the part about the the self being annihilated at the time of death. There's, you know, you're, you're gone. You don't have to worry. Some of, some of those people would say there's no heaven. There's no heaven or hell. You know, you're just gone. You're annihilated. On the other extreme is a view that the person continues forever. Isn't that the Buddhist pers perspective? No, this person doesn't continue. A subtle consciousness continues, but there's no identity attached to that. Right. And even the subtle consciousness that continues <laughs> it, from the point of view of emptiness, it's empty of existing the way that it appears. It's, it's just imputed as, an, as a subtle consciousness. So it's much different than the person existing, like after death, I, I, George, will still think George and I will continue. That's, that's kind of this extreme view. Donnie, are you raising your hand? No, you're just clearing your, the hair off your face. Yeah, okay. So the commentary says, uh, this is Kanchen Yeshi Gelson's commentary. Just as has been said above, <laughs> it is an afflicted wisdom. Remember, we're, these. this is sort of the, the, the 51 mental factors here are kind of like Sotrantika Chittamatra. So it's still saying they are, uh, these are, are all afflicted wisdoms. I think Prasenkika would say they are afflicted wisdoms also, but the President Kika would say that some other states of mind are also an afflicted wisdoms, not just the views. It is an afflicted wisdom that obscures the self 
that is held by the view of the transitory collection. So here he's getting into a little more general, not saying uh, that obscures the aggregates, but obscures the self that's imputed upon the aggregates uh, held by the view of the transitory collection. And it apprehends it to be either permanent or annihilated. Permanent can kind of mean, it, not necessarily permanent in the sense of <clears throat> not changing moment by moment, although it can mean that, but kind of the sense of eternal. It has, um, how does it hold that self to be either permanent or annihilated? The Lan Rim Chemo, the great exposition of the stages of the path, which Lama Sovkapa's great Lan Rim text says, the view holding to an extreme is an afflicted wisdom which observing the self that is held by the view of the transitory collection. Remember here, lower tenets would say the view of the transitory collection views the aggregates, whereas here he's saying it as in the upper tenets, the Mahayana, the view of the transitory collection views the self, the conventional self, views, uh, observes the self that is held by the view of the transitory collection, views it as either being permanent in the sense of, of being unchanging or of being annihilated in the sense of not transmigrating to a future life after this life. That's probably from my, my experience, that seems to be more common kind of worldly view of people who are not religious. You know, people that are religious and they, and they have a belief in uh, maybe being born in heaven or hell, or what's the in in Catholicism? What's the alternative, Karen? Was it was it called purgatory? Purgatory. <laughs> like, uh, who was the famous person who wrote? Is it is that the name of the text? Pur purgatory. The great great Italian author, Bob. You know Dante. 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 Dante, heaven and hell. What was the text called? Heaven and hell. Heaven and hell, Bob. Is it called oh, heaven no, and hell? I know. He, 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 the, the divine comedy. Divine. Yeah, it's the divine comedy, which has three parts. Yeah, which goes from, yeah, it, it includes a hellish part and a heavenly part to it. That's called purgatorio, right? The, yeah, or limbo or purgatories. So. Yeah. I think, I don't think, lim, I'm not sure limbo is not Latin or whatever, I think, or Italian. So anyway, um, that's probably the view that most people hold, my, my opinion. You, you think about it, tell me if, if you have a different idea. So there, that quotation is finished from Lan Rim Chum, and he says, therefore, since the bad, since this bad view, negative view, causes one to fall to the extremes of permanence and annihilation, it is the principal obstacle to progressing on the middle path free of these extremes. So I've mentioned a text sometime by Maitreya called the uh, Uta Namche in Tibetan, the Madhyama Vibang, uh, Madhyanta Vibhangna. Madhya means middle, Anta means extremes, Vibhangna means analyzing, analyzing the middle from the extremes. So when you talk about extreme view from the Prasangika point of view, this is also included, which is like a gross extreme view, but more subtle extreme view is when you hold phenomena to be inherent, you know, so some kind of inherent existence, even though you don't use the word inherent existence, you're grasping to some kind of inherent existence like it's permanent or the, the it, from the present, uh, from the, when you're talking about the view, the other extreme is that things are, that they don't exist at all, that they're just, you know, this is kind of a wrong view. Even you, you don't, you don't attribute to them any kind of efficacy of karma and cause and effect and so forth. So this gross wrong view can be a hindrance to realizing the correct middle view also 
which is free from the extremes of permanence or annihilation. Make sense? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then the next wrong, the next afflicted view, they're not called wrong views. One of them is called wrong view. Um, so this order is the traditional order. Actually, this, <laughs> this view is called conception of uh, bad views as supreme or viewing views as supreme, grasping them as supreme. That is to say, the Abhidharma Samachaya says, what is the conception of view as supreme? He has in parentheses bad views. So there's three of these views that are, that are considered here, not all uh, five of these views. It is any endurance, desire, intelligence, conception, or view which views, view here is that, at, uh, verb, right? Views, <laughs> meaning certain views, and the locus of views, that is the five appropriated aggregates to be supreme, to be chief, to be superior, and to be excellent. It has the function of acting as a support for strongly adhering to bad views. So what does that mean? Well, let's say, let's take the first view. If you think that the view of the transitory collection you know, that there is an inherently existent person. If you think that that's correct, you are, you know, you're convinced of that, that's an example. And, and you think that that's the correct view, that's right. And you hold it as supreme. That's an example of this, but there's some others also. Just has been said above, it is an afflicted wisdom that observes other bad views and the aggregates, which are their locus here. It says, in the case of Prasankika, we would say, and the person, not just the aggregates, independence upon which they arise and holds them to be supreme. Here, are the synonyms supreme and so forth in the citation above are explained as follows. Since it is conceited about being marvelous it holds them to supreme. It holds them to be supreme, since it holds that there is none more outstanding than them. There's no view better than this. There's none that is more outstanding than them. It holds them to be chief. It holds them to be superior to other views, and since it holds that there is none equal to them, it holds them to be excellent. You know, great. The Lundrum Chemel says, oops, where am I? The conception of a bad view as supreme is an afflicted wisdom which observes any of the three. So these are the three views that it views. It doesn't view itself. Oh yeah, I guess. Any of the three, the view of the transitory collection, the, the conception of, of, of views as supreme, any of the three, the view of the transitory collection, the conception of views as supreme or wrong views. So those are the three views that it views. It views itself as, as correct and chief and good, you know, that it holds these, but it views a view of the transitory collection and wrong views, which we haven't come, come across yet. That, that's the, the last one, the fifth one in this list. So in some lists, you talk about these, these three views first, the view of the transitory collection, um, and wrong view and the view, and then you would talk about the view that holds itself and these other two views as supreme, bad views and the view of the transitory collection. And the aggregates of the viewer independence upon which they, 
i.e. the above three views arise and holds them to be supreme. Its function is specified as acting as a support for strongly adhering to wrong views. You know what strongly adhering means? It means uh, grasping, but in a sense that you have convinced yourself that this is true, strongly adhering to these, to wrong views, because it deposits because it deposits the imprints for not separating from bad views in this and future lives. So this is really quite disastrous. If you were to, uh, having come to the conclusion that there is an inherently, inherently existent self and convinced yourself by developing this uh, view of uh, that views that as supreme, that views the, the view of the transitory collection as supreme and correct, and that's how it is. It leaves imprints to, that prevents you from overcoming those wrong views in the future. So let me skip just to a sec, for a second to wrong view, the last one of these five. We'll skip over uh, the ethics and modes of conduct as supreme. So on, on page, at the bottom of page 66, wrong view, lokta. You'll encounter that many times in uh, the scriptures when we talk lokta, wrong view. And in the time of the Buddha, there were many kinds of wrong views. What is a wrong view? Again, from the Abhidharma Samachaya, it is any endurance, desire, intelligence, conception, or view which deprecates cause, effect, here it says result, cause, result, or functionality, and wrongly conceives existing, existent disintegrating things. You know, it, it doesn't believe that things are impermanent. That, that would be an, another example. So for instance, not believing in karma, uh, that actions will have results uh, in future lives, or possibly this life, uh, believing that, not believing in subtle impermanence, not believing in these things that are conducive to realizing the path are called wrong views. It has the function of severing the roots of virtue, holding tightly to the roots of non-virtue and acting as a support for engaging in non-virtue and not engaging in virtue. If you don't believe in karma, you know, you're, uh, you easily engage in non-virtuous act actions, not imagining them to be uh, harmful to yourself. Here it says it has the function of severing the roots of virtue or roots of virtue. Does anyone know what does that mean? What does that mean? What that means? Ellen, do you know what that means? Severing roots of virtue? If you're holding to the wrong views, it no. the good, the good ones, it obscures them and prevents them from, from developing. I didn't catch what Donnie said. You're so far from your, your microphone. That's okay. That's okay. Stephen, did you have a, a thought? Uh, they are three of the non-virtuous mental factors, um, non-hatred, non-attachment, and non-ignorance. They are three of the non-virtuous or virtuous? I'm sorry, virtuous. Virtuous, okay. Yeah, I was, yeah sorry, I got them back. Right, right. severing roots of, roots, the roots of virtue. Uh, also, uh, many times in the, in the texts, it talks, especially in the Hinayana, it talks about someone uh, who has severed the roots of virtue. And therefore, th there's, there's an idea, there are certain individuals who will never achieve liberation, let alone enlightenment. It's talking about from the Hinayana point of view, right? Never achieve because they've severed the roots of virtue. That means that they have developed uh, this kind of wrong view uh, that prevents them 
from creating virtue and perpetuates the creation of non-virtue. But from the, <clears throat> even the higher Hinayana schools, the Shatrantika and uh, maybe even some of the Vaibhashikas and certainly the Mahayana, we say that there is no one who has severed the roots of virtue who can never regain those virtuous states of mind. They can all be gained again. And every, se every sentient being <clears throat> has the potential to achieve enlightenment. From a Mahayana point of view, every sentient being will eventually become enlightened. Even if they become an arhat first, uh, at a certain point, they'll be awakened from that samadhi. They won't have necessarily a physical body, but they, they will be awakened from that samadhi by the Buddhas <clears throat> and reminded that they haven't <clears throat> achieved the highest state and they'll through through entering back into samsara by making prayers to ripen karmic seeds on their consciousness uh, they will develop bodhicitta they've already realized emptiness because they're an arhat and they will eventually achieve enlightenment but it takes a very very long time to do that so it has the function of severing the roots of virtue, holding tightly to roots of non-virtue. What, what are roots of non-virtue? Anyone want to make a stab? Nadine, can you guess? Yes, I guess the root afflictions are the roots of the non-virtues. Yeah, I, I would say probably uh, of those uh, probably the roots of non-virtue here means the opposites of the roots of virtue. So that would mean ignorance, anger, and attachment. You know, when we talk about that. So it had holding tightly to those, keeping those, acting as a support for engaging in non-virtue and not engaging in virtue. Make sense so far? Bob's Bob's checking on something. You, you okay? Yeah. No, I, I was just reading the other translation of the oh, okay, right. of the Abhidharma, which actually is in some ways, I think actually parts of it are clearer than our part. Because when I read our part, the wrong view, when it talks about endurance, desire, intelligence, to me that doesn't, I don't know, it, it seems a little bit funny for a wrong right. view. Whereas right. this other one talks about more. The admission, inclination, idea, point of view, opinion of him who denies cause and effect or action, which I think means karma. So in other words, somebody who has the wrong view, rejecting the key tenets of Buddhism. Right. It would be right. wrong view. So I think it's interesting when I, find, when I read this other translation, it's more meaningful to me, you know, of what a wrong view is. Very good. So, uh, yeah, it's very good to in, to sometimes check other translations. Um, before I, uh, I'll read that. And Doris, you got your hand up. You have an, a, a thought? It's not quite related to Bob's question, but in the definition, functionality. Does that refer to the functionality of of karma or something different? I believe it does. I, th I think it does, it does refer to that. So in Geshe Rapton's book for mistaken view, uh, <laughs> mind and its function, he says a mistaken view, which we're calling here wrong view, lokta, is an afflicted state of intelligence that denies the existence of something which in fact exists and acts as a basis for the obstruction of any wholesome conduct. An example of a mistaken view would be the denial of any causal relationship between actions and their results. Okay. Why give why give away money? There's you're just losing your money. You know that that thought that there's not going to be any karmic consequence to that. An example of a mistaken view would be denial of any causal relationship between actions and their results a refusal to believe that happiness is the outcome of virtue or that suffering is the outcome of evil. 
likewise to deny that a state of freedom from suffering exists. You know, you can't, there's no such thing of escaping from cyclic existence. That thought would be a wrong view, would also constitute a mistaken view. In addition, in addition to mistaken views that deny the existence of something which is existent, we can also speak of mistaken views that ascribe existence to that which is not existent. Those would also be called mistaken views. Can you think of an example of that? Mm -hmm. Christine, what do you think? Well, the transitory collection, all phenomena, we think they're real. Right, grasping to inherent existence. Yeah. So there is wrong view can kind of include some of the other views. Let's continue here. As been said above, it is an afflicted wisdom which views the cause which views cause and result of actions, past and future lives, and so forth as non-existent. Milan Rim Chimo says, uh, wrong view is an afflicted wisdom which deprecates stating past and future, li past and future lives, actions and their results, and so forth do not exist. There's no continuity of life, uh, there's no karma and so forth. And which holds that Ishvara, the fundamental nature, this is sort of a Vedic, one of the Vedic schools, uh, the, the, one of the theistic, not, not all of the Vedic schools are theistic. That is to say, they don't all believe in God. Some of them are non-theistic, but here the one that believes Ishvara, the fundamental nature and the like to be the cause of migrating beings. From Buddhist point of view, that would include Christianity, like believing in a creator God. That would be that would be called a, a, a wrong view. When wrong views are divided, there are four wrong views that deprecate a wrong view that deprecates causes, wrong views that deprecate causes, wrong views that deprecate results, wrong views that deprecate functionality and wrong view that deprecate existent things. Functionality, again, meaning that things uh, that cause and effect uh, function and so forth. So explaining the first, the wrong view that deprecates causes is a view that, that good behavior and bad behavior and so forth do not exist. There's no sense of, uh, you know, criticizing me for my bad behavior because it's not gonna have any results, you know, that that this is not a cause of anything. Uh, Christine, you have a, a thought before I go further? Yes, what does the word de deprecate mean? And why do they use the word deprecate? I don't... Uh... Deny, deprecate. De deprecate means when you ascribe to something which does exist and try to lower it. You know, eh, he's, he may be smart, but he's not that smart. Or, you know, or actually deny something, you know. He's not smart at all. Okay. Deprecate. Okay, thank you. Wrong view that deprecates causes is the view that view is the view that good behavior and bad behavior and so forth do not exist. Wrong view that deprecates results. Example, wrong view that deprecates results is the view that the fruition of virtuous actions and misdeeds does not exist. You have another question. Oh, okay, you had this up. Third one, uh, deprecating functionality is the view that one's parents, past and future lie, worlds, rebirths and so forth do not exist. View that deprecates functionality is the view that one's parents, past and future, worlds, That's, that means past rebirths and future rebirths do not exist. I'm not sure what, what means by parents here. Does anyone have a thought? I wonder if that's a mistranslation from what the Tibetan says. I don't have the Tibetan 
printed out here, so I have to, I'd have to <laughs> leave this to go to look at it. Venerable uh, George, yes, could it be just referring to the mother and father in the song of? Uh, now it's not the song of experience, but recognizing the mother. Could that be what they're referring as parents? Um, what are we talking about? Wrong view. Oops. I get back here. I don't think it means uh, father and mother clear light or something like that. Um, I wonder if it's talking about Where are we? Which is the third one, right? I wonder if it's talking about uh, the wrong view that deprecates functionality is a view that one's parents, past and future lives, and so forth, do not exist. I, I wonder if it's referring to the fact that uh, one might hold that there one has not had had mothers in previous lifetimes, but here it says parents. Maybe it's meaning that. Lewis, what, what's what's your thought? I was thinking that it, it might refer to the belief in self rising aggregates, self rising physical aggregates. They didn't come from any source. Yeah, that would be a really egregious <laughs> wrong view right i didn't most most well yeah it's possible yeah it's possible i would imagine that most people would uh you know what do they say the stork brought me or something like that they they have grown grown out of that but that's a possibility i'll, I'll check the tibetan nadine did you have or christine one of you had a, a thought i saw out of the corner of my eye no Okay, so that I will flag that to try to figure out what what it means uh, when deprecating functionality, uh, when talking about one's parents, past and future worlds means past and future lives and so forth. And the fourth one, wrong view that deprecates existent things, the wrong view that deprecates, uh, that views the attainment of foe destroyer and so forth do not exist. That, you know, that liberation does not exist, enlightenment does not exist. From a Buddhist point of view, those are existent phenomena. They're conventionally existent. They don't exist inherently. Even achieving Buddhahood, Buddha is not inherently existent, but they do exist, those states. So holding that they don't exist would be the view that deprecates existent things. Then it continues to say, although in general, there are many wrong views, since the wrong view that deprecates actions and their results, that deprecates past and future worlds, in other words, rebirths and so forth, severs all roots of virtue, it is taught to be the most serious among all wrong views. So, we have the view of the transitory collection now, and we can practice virtue on the basis of that. It's not as bad as this wrong view that deprecates, uh, you know, cause and effect and so forth. So why did I jump to this? Because of the the, the view that of uh, what are we, how is it translated here? Conception of bad views is supreme. It views the view of the transitory collection, wrong views, and itself as supreme. Okay. So now after that, number four, uh, which I skipped on the bottom of page 65, conception of ethics and modes of conduct as supreme. So it means um, inferior ethics. It, it doesn't mean actual ethics. If you view the practice of ethics from a Buddhist point of view, morality as, as being you know, worthy and maybe even supreme, that, it, that is not this view. This is a view that views things like, uh, I've mentioned in, in the past, some Hindu yogis, Vedic yogis on the Ganges <clears throat> would stand on one leg 
they'd have their other leg, you know, tucked up, you know, like sort of a yogic posture and believing that this asceticism, mode of conduct, ascetic practice, uh, purifies negative karma and bestows through you know, enduring these kinds of um, things, one will experience moksha, which is a synonym of, in Buddhism is a synonym of nirvana. Usually they don't use the word nirvana, they say moksha. Or the, the 10 fires, remember I mentioned uh, fire in front and you'd actually sit with, someone would help you, they would make a fire in front of you, behind you, on either side, in the intermediate directions, the sun above, and I'm not sure the 10th, if there's a fire that you sit on ashes or something, enduring this purifying negative karma, this kind of view that this is what will lead, lead you to moksha, to uh, you know, liberation. Here it says, regarding the conception of bad ethics and modes of conduct is supreme. The Abhinarma Samachaya says, what is that? It is an, any endurance, desire, intelligence, conception, or view which views bad ethics and modes of conduct and the locus of the bad ethics and modes of conduct, that is the five appropriated aggregates, to be purifying, you know, standing on one leg or, have you seen the Indian, they, they sometimes they put through their tongue a, uh, blade uh, through their I think it's through their cheeks, um, other kinds of things like this, with the, the thought that that kind of activity purifies negative karma. But to be purifying, liberating, and delivering, it has the function of acting as a support for fruitless fatigue. <laughs> alliteration, good alliteration, alliteration there. Fruitless fatigue. Make sense? Doesn't bring any, any, the result that you expect other than being fatiguing, tiring. Lanrim Chemo says, the conception of bad ethics and modes of conduct as supreme is an afflictive wisdom which observes, observes bad ethics which supposedly abandon immortality. which supposedly abandon, I would think it, again, I'll flag that one. I, I, again, that looks like, it, which supposedly bring about immortality. I'm not sure. Unless it- Immorality, means, Venerable George. Oh, immorality. immorality. Thank you. I was saying immortality. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have to flag that one, that's, that's clear. Bad ethics, which supposedly abandon immorality. So, how does it abandon immorality? Because it is supreme kind of conduct. These, what a Buddhist would say were fruitless and tiring and so forth. Thank you for <laughs> not immortality. My eyes. Bad modes of conduct which prescribe attire, behavior, physical and verbal activities. So does anyone know an example of that? Bob, you well read. I, I mean, are they talking about these religious rituals? Well, sometimes uh, some some people uh, there, there's some some story like this in the in the past, someone with limited clairvoyance saw that in a previous life they were a pig, and uh, in the future life they were born as a human. And they thought that acting like a pig brought that human life about. They didn't, they didn't have a, a, an understanding of cause and effect. They had just limited clairvoyance, which is possible, seeing certain things and, and deriving uh, you know, assumptions from that. So um, behavior, acting like a pig would bring about uh, you know, some virtuous thing in the future. Uh, attire, physical and verbal activities. Uh, what, 
would would mean you know various kinds of things of thinking of, of these various activities is bringing about liberation just by themselves without the need of correct view or understanding karma or anything it is uh, an afflicted wisdom that observes the aggregates of the viewer independence on which they the above two bad ethics and modes of conduct arise and views them as purifying misdeeds, liberating one from afflictions, and definitely delivering one from cyclic existence. So if you ever look at uh, one of these coffee table books of the Ganges River, you must, you know what I'm talking about, you know, the big pictures of all these present yogis, maybe black and white photos of ones from the past, standing on one leg or uh, in, in, in pel, impaling their body with with uh, spears and so forth, or ex experiencing extreme asceticism, uh, these is these are the kinds of activities that are talked about. Christine, thank you, Vinod Jars. My question is: um, in our world, there's this, it seems to me, prevalent idea that. Um, violence, meeting violence with violence will end the violence, you know, right, fire with fire, right? right, right. So could you call that? Would that be this? <laughs> I think that would, that would, that could fall. Well, like, I'm not sure if that's considered uh, correct ethics. Maybe, yeah, maybe the certain people believe that's political parties believe that's, that's good ethics. Uh, but from the Buddhist point of view, you know, when we talked in the past about the uh, certain qualities of a spiritual person, they do not respond to abuse by uh, abusing the other person. If they don't respond to being hit by hitting the other person and so forth. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that's that would that would fall under. Uh, perhaps wrong view, not believing in cause and effect, you know, believing, oh, okay. you know, it could, could, you could think of it as, as, as falling into this also. I mean, some people seem to be extreme about it, like in Afghan, in Afghanistan, you know, I mean, they're very extreme about it. You know, they run around with guns all the time and everything. And they see, they seem to think it's religious, it's spiritual, you know, or they say right. it is. I mean, I don't understand them, so I don't want to make a judgment, but it appears to be an extreme uh, situation to me. Yes. In my limited understanding. I would agree. Yeah. Doris, you have a, a, another thought? Thank you, Venerable. Yeah. Kind of like that, that expression, fruitless fatigue, but it's referring to fruitless pursuits of things that you think are going to be enlightenment it's not fruitless as in or fruitless fatigue as in going to the amusement park or anything like that right uh i, yeah, I don't think that would <laughs> this is thinking not, that not, these not, activities, like not paying attention to you know thinking that these these modes of behavior uh will bring you liberation and say is, is liberating one from afflictions and definitely delivering one from cyclic existence. Um, so for instance, uh, maybe even sacrificing animals. Would that would that fall under this? You know, believing that sacrificing animals, like in Nepal, every year during the Kopan course in November, there's a great festival where they sacrifice. Uh, thousands or if not tens of thousands of buffalo and sheep uh, to the gods. Well, and also in the in the Abraham, Abrahamic religions, also in the Bible, the Old Testament, sacrificing sheep in order to pacify uh, the Godhead or whatever. From a Buddhist perspective, that might fall into this kind of uh, activity. You know that's it. You know it's fruitless. It doesn't bring about the expected result. In fact, it creates negative karma. It is sim It is simply to be understood that it functions. That its function is 
acting as a support for fruitless fatigue. Okay, makes sense. So we've gone through these five afflicted views, right? Now, at the end of that section, it's, there's a discussion of the category of the afflicted views. Furthermore, when the five types of views are condensed, they can be condensed or subsumed into two views, views that superimpose and views that deprecate. So this is an important concept. You, you'll find a lot in uh, when we talk about, uh, even in Tantra and, and various things, say for instance, uh, when you're trying to achieve the highest, a view in which the mind realizes that all, that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence while simultaneously functioning uh, example is given sometimes as uh, view a view that doesn't superimpose or deprecate, uh, you know, view a viewing like like viewing a moon in a lake. It doesn't it doesn't think it doesn't superimpose that that's an actual moon, and it doesn't deprecate that there's nothing happening whatsoever. You know, sort of ignoring the 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 fact that this is a reflection and so forth. Superimposition means adding something which is not there. Deprecating means removing or denying something which is actually existent, say conventionally existent. Make sense? Superimposition and deprecation, they're two, two extremes. When the five are divided, there are infinite divisions. The 20 views of the transitory collection that we went about, we talked about last time. The 62 bad views. So where do you find that? You, you'll find in, especially in the in the in the Pali canon, uh, when you talk about bad views, you talk about the 62 wrong views, which are elaborations of these uh, five. The 14 unspecified views, what are those? Ida, do you know, have you heard of the uh, 14 unpredicted or unspecified views? No, Venerable, I have not. Nadine, have you? Who's heard? Bob's heard, I'm sure. No? So very, very famous and worth knowing. Um, certain, during the time of the Buddha, various people would ask the Buddha, when the Tathagata dies, you know, referring to the Buddha as the Tathagata, does he, uh, in, in, in the future, will he, does he exist or does he not exist? What would that be? That would be kind of like asking, that it's just assuming that there is a view of extreme. That's the assumption. The Buddha either continues to exist or he's annihilated after death. So what did the Buddha do? He just said, he didn't say anything. He refused to answer. Pardon? Refused to answer. That's Donnie from the cloud, right? <laughs> we just see the cloud, yes, yes. He refused to answer. Well, it's not like he said, I refuse to answer, like, like politicians or something. He just remained silent. He didn't make a prediction. He didn't answer. Uh, so there were 14 different situations like this in which the Buddha remained silent, mainly because by giving an answer in those stark terms, the Buddha is either annihilated or continues to exist, that would give the person the wrong, wrong, uh, where's my hand? I have my picture reversed here, so I don't, I don't see things to say. Uh, it would give people the wrong impression. And also it was not the time without laying foundation to explain in more detail. So in certain cir circumstances, the Buddha remained silent. Do you have any situations like that in everyday life with children or other people? 
Aida, are you thinking, thinking of something? Yeah, with the husband as well. <laughs> you remain silent. <laughs> you it's, either, it's either my way or the highway or something like this, you know, and maybe there's no in between. And, and it's, not the, it's not a situation right now that you can explain in detail. The other person's mind is grasping onto things. So the offshoot of this was that some people assumed, therefore, that the Buddha didn't know that the Buddha was not omniscient. He didn't know whether he existed or, you know, afterwards or uh, whether he was annihilated and so forth. So that's the basis for some criticism of the Buddha, the 14 unanswered questions, or what do we call here, unspecified views. Make sense? Okay. And so forth. So there are, many kinds of bad views that include all of these others. The 62 bad views are taught in the net of Brahma, the Brahma Jala Sutra. So that's a very famous sutra and uh, sometimes, sometimes misappropriated, misinterpreted to talk about that all phenomena are in are in are interrelated, sort of explaining about uh, the dependent origination. But anyway, the Brahma Brahma, the net of Brahma Sutra, the Brahma Jala Sutra. Uh, in that sutra, it enumerates these sixty-two wrong views. So if you're interested, you can you can Google Brahma the Brahma Jala uh, Brahma Jala Sutra or net of Brahma Sutra and and uh, check them out. Fearing wordiness, you know, fearing to become too verbose. If I were to set forth the individual identities in detail, you know, fearing, fearing to become too uh, 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 verbose. If I were to do that, I shall not mention them here. So he doesn't go into detail about the 62, which probably some people are happy <laughs> not to have even more. The 14 unspecified views, here we go. The four views which are based on the past limit, four views which are based on the future limit, four which are based on nirvana, and two views which are based on the body and life force. So what are those? The four which are based on the past limit or path extreme of the past are views that the self and the world are permanent, are impermanent, are both and are neither. So uh, what are we talking about here? We're talking about, yeah, wrong views, right? The 14 unspecified views. Four views which are based on the past, past extreme, future extreme, based on nirvana, and two that are based on body and life force. So four, four which are based on the past are the views that the self and the world are permanent, are impermanent, are both, and are neither. Well, aren't they impermanent? Something to, something to check in the explanation of that view. The four which are based on the future limit are the views that the self and the world have a limit, do not have a limit, have both a limit and not a limit, and have neither. The four that are based on nirvana are the views that the Tathagata will arise after passing away, will not arise, will both arise and not arise, or will do neither. Those are views that the people were just saying, it had to be these, one of these, and the Buddha remained, uh, you know, without responding, did not respond. He didn't, when it says unspecified or un, another way of, of translating that is unpredicted. When we talk about karma, remember we say negative karma, negative karma, and unpredicted unspecified. That means the Buddha didn't say it was virtuous or non-virtuous. Therefore, it is kind of neutral. 
The two based on the body and life force are the views that the body and life force are one or different substances. So again, not so simple to say uh, that the body and life force are one or different. So the Buddha remained without responding, didn't, didn't specify an answer to that. These views were asserted by the Samkhyas. That's a the Sanskrit name of one of the Vedic schools. Here, it's, they call it enumerators. They enumerated the various, uh, almost like Vaibhashika in a sense, uh, enumerating the, the various uh, things that existed. The Charvakas, the hedonists. Does anyone know what the, who the Charvakas were? David, do you know, have you heard? Travicus? Karen? No one's, oh, Bob has, okay. Yeah, I, I think they're the material, but sometimes they're called the materialists. They're, they're an early school, I think. And I think they believe that, you know, only material things exist and so forth. I think that materialists would be uh, attributed to maybe the Samkhya's more. Uh, Travicus were uh, people that, didn't believe in cause and effect. So that if like, like say for instance, there was a famous book written by one famous founder of the tra Travicus uh, that, uh, oh, you know, from modern terminology seemed like he wanted to have a incestuous relationship with his daughter. And so he wrote that there was no, result of there's no bad result from this uh probably you you would hedonists you know eat drink and be merry because uh what's what's the last line of that eat drink and be merry because what's it doris tomorrow we die or you may die tomorrow yeah die. tomorrow you you may die tomorrow oh, may yeah. never come or something like that so the hedonists were uh the Travicas were oblivious to the uh, edicts of morality and uh, karma and so forth. The Nirgrantas, who are, who are the Nirgrantas? Here says the naked ones. What's another name for the Nirgrantas? What is the, Bob? Were, were those the Jains? So the Jains, certain Jains were called Nirgrantas. Not all Jains uh, were naked but some Jains were, and then some other, uh, well, the Jains were not Vedic, but some other Vedic schools also uh, were naked, you know? So that would include both of them. The Vatsiputriyas, a subschool of the particularists. Who were the Vatsiputriyas? Does anyone remember? Who were the particularists? Particularists were what we called, I think we called the Vaibhashikas, right? Uh, that didn't, that said, for instance, the, the person is, is not the aggregates, is not different than the aggregates, it's something in between. Here I have merely mentioned the names of these views. If you wish to understand in detail their individual identities, as well as the manner in which they arose, then you should, could, you should consult the precious sutras in the middle way texts that comment upon their intention. So I think you can find an enumeration in uh, Jeffrey Hopkins book, Maps of the Profound, um, when it talks about the 62 wrong views, if you're interested in, in learning more about this. I put it in the text too. Come again? I put it in the text too. I didn't catch that. The text box. Text box. Yeah, in the text, I put links. I, I think she means chat box. Oh, chat box. Yeah, yes, I see. Universe is eternal. Thank you, Donnie, from the cloud. <laughs> I get burned out with that video on it. It hurts me. Yes, no, I understand. So why are these views called unspecified or unpredicted? 
They are called unspecified because they are neither posited as virtue nor as non-virtue. Rather, when these samkhyas and so forth proceeding from the assumption of a self of persons questioned whether the self and the world are permanent, impermanent, and so forth, the Buddha, deeming them to be unsuitable vessels for the time being, did not teach the selflessness of the person. And with the thought that the absence of a qualified basis And with the thought that in the absence of a qualified basis, a qualifying attribute is inappropriate. You know, should you, should you call a, a self-existent person permanent or impermanent? You know, the, the, the basis being a self-existent person, uh, it's, it's inappropriate to dignify that with some attribute that is permanent and impermanent because it doesn't exist at all. The Buddha did not respond to these questions. Hence, they are called unspecified or unpredicted questions. In this way, the precious garland says, when asked whether the world has an end, this is a very famous verse from the precious garland. When asked whether the world has an end, the conqueror remained silent. He didn't respond. So he didn't answer. Because he did not teach to, to non-vessels. Non-vessel, what, what does a non-vessel mean? It means a vessel of the teachings means an individual who is a su suitable recipient, recipient, recipient of the teachings. You can pour in the nectar of the Dharma into them, right? That's the sense of vessel. Because he did not teach to non-vessels the profound Dharma, the wise understand that the omniscient one is indeed omniscient. It's not as though he didn't know, <laughs> which is what you know. the people criticizing the Buddha saying that, you know, he didn't answer these questions, he didn't know, right? Okay, so now, now we get to so juicy ones, the 20 secondary afflictions, nienong, nienong, or newe, uh, what do we call? What, what are the afflictions? I'm forgetting the, the Tibetan. So klesha is, uh, is, these are near to the klesha. That means approaching or not, not fully the root ones. The 20 secondary afflictions are belligerence, resentment, concealment. So there are different ways of ordering them. This is the traditional uh, ordering some of them are sort of connected with one another further along the line, but let's say the, the usual order, belligerence, resentment, concealment, spite, jealousy, miserliness, deceit, and dissimulation, a little bit different, haughtiness, not exactly pride, a particular kind of pride, harmfulness, non-shame, non-embarrassment. Remember the roots of virtue, we had uh, embarrassment and shame. These are the opposites. Excitement, non-faith, laziness, non-conscientiousness, forgetfulness, non-introspection, and distraction. So excitement and distraction, again, related, but slightly different. Earlier, I mentioned, and, I, and I've, I've said it on a couple of different occasions, when we talk about uh, the afflictions uh, or the virtuous states of mind that are actual and imputed. Do you remember talking about this? Like, say, for instance, uh, non-bewilderment. Is, is there actual, is there something distinct from wisdom which was one of the object ascertaining mental factors, which is non-bewilderment. Non-bewilderment is kind of like an imputed, uh, imputed upon a particular kind of wisdom uh, that has certain attributes. Because not all, not all wisdom, because we, we saw that even wisdom can be negative sometimes, right? Non, 
non-bewilderment is a particular kind of wisdom. So it's, it's, an, it's said to be an imputed uh, mental factor. I sort of wonder if, if not all of these 20 are imputed, uh, you know, because they're imputed on the three root delusions. But anyway, something for discussion or con contemplation. So the first one, troa, a belligerence, or what's another way it's translated? Bob, you have the, you have Abhidharma Samachaya there. What is it, what is he called? This first one, he always, uh, Rapola, translated into French and that was translated into English. So I'm not sure it gets exactly the no, same. He, he translated it as anger. He just translates it as anger. And what we call anger, I think he translated as hatred or something like that, or, or some other, some other- Repugnance, I think. Repugnance, <laughs> <laughs> right. So you have to be careful. All of these different words, you have to understand. Uh, that's why sometimes it's worth knowing a little bit of Tibetan or Sanskrit and learning some of these things. So here, what is belligerence? It is a, a malice, a malicious state of mind when the cause of harm abides nearby and is involved with anger. So that's why I said it's, it's you know, maybe imputed. It has the function of acting as a support for taking up weapons, punishing and so forth and preparing to injure others. It is a malice, malicious state of mind when the cause of harm abides nearby. What does that mean, the cause of harm? Is the cause of harm that which you might use to retaliate or is the cause of harm meaning uh, what is causing you harm? Doris? I, I, in my feeble way, I was trying to say, I think it's the first one. Oh, I see. First, okay. Meaning what? 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 What is close? The weapons that you might use? The weapons, the opportunity. I mean, now I'm not sure. It has the function of acting as a support for taking up weapons, punishing and so forth, and preparing to do to injure others. As been said above, so now Kachin Yeshi Gelson's commentary, it is a malice that wishes to harm by striking and so forth when any of the nine bases of malice abides nearby. Remember, we talked about the, the nine bases before. Uh, the thought that this person has harmed me, is harming me now, will harm me in the future. Uh, the thought that this person has harmed my friend my family is harming them now, will harm them in the future, or this person has benefited my enemies, is benefiting them now, and will benefit them in the future. What's the famous thing? The people act like it's some Chinese proverb. The, the, my enemy's enemy is my friend. <laughs> That's kind of like one of these things, right? As though, uh, someone who har harms your enemy is someone who is, is, should be thought of as your friend. The nine are explained to be the nine bases of, these nine are explained to be the nine bases of malice. So that's worth, worth knowing if you're asking about what's, you know, some hints for the final exam, right? The scriptural source for this is just as in the previous citation uh, when we talked about anger, we talked about nine sources of anger. So in Geshe Repton's book, he calls this one, rather than, what did we call it here, belligerence? He calls it wrath, troa. So when you talk about wrathful deities, that's the word that's often used, troa. So wrath is a mental factor that due to an increase of anger, this is still the same one, this is just a different translation it's rather than saying belligerence. The mental factor, that due to an increase of anger is a thoroughly malicious state of mind wishing to cause immediate harm. You know, anger, remember when we talked about anger and hatred, the difference, if there was a, if it, there was a difference between them. Now, uh, wrath 
is something that wants to do something right now. It's just gotten so angry. It's, it's impelling you to do something. It has the function of directly connecting the person who intends to cause harm with the actual means to do so. You know, so like what Doris was saying, the first one, grabbing the weapon, you know, what can I use to hit him on the head? You know, what, you know, uh, or yeah, we'll use that. As with anger, we can distinguish three or nine forms of wrath. When we, we just talked about the, the nine sources of wrath or belligerence. So, just, so then there's a discussion on the pair anger and belligerence or anger and wrath, or you could say hatred and wrath, whatever. Qualm, since anger occurs in the context of the root afflictions and belligerence in the context, context of secondary afflictions, what is the difference between anger and belligerence? And uh, he answers his own question. Perhaps anger is an intolerant and malicious mind occurring when the three objects dawn as objects of observation, whereas belligerence is an extremely disturbed state of mind, which upon a great intensifying of anger, wishes to strike, strike physically when the cause of anger abides nearby. Here, when it says physically, because that one of the, the future of one of the, the, the coming mental factors, spite, is means to use words. Christine. Oh, thank you, Venerable George. So um, I'm a little confused because I got the idea that these secondary afflictions, you said they approach kleshas. They're, they're not quite as extreme as maybe the root afflictions or as intense or as is that an incorrect assumption on my on my part? So they are not the affliction. They are not the root afflictions. They are similar to or close to the root afflictions. So uh, in the case in, in here, sometimes they're more intensified, like right, that's my like like this one belligerence. Oh, it doesn't okay. mean that uh, that they are lesser oh. in, that, in that respect. Okay, that yeah, that's why I was a little confused. So they that makes sense. Yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't mean anything about their intensity or their um, it, it, the close uh, being close to the afflictions or secondary afflictions. Uh, it, it it's not implying that they're well, yeah, it, they're they're similar to the afflictions, but they are not the actual afflictions. They're not the main ones. Bob, Bob, you, you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I've always thought that there's sort of like more details. Like you have the root ones, and then these are sort of like different aspects of the root ones that sort of flow out. Yeah, so my, my I, I kind of agree with Bob there that, that there are, in a sense, that's why I said that they are uh, in, more imputed. Even some of the root delusions are imputed as opposed to actual. Okay, so let, let's continue here. Uh, Asanga's uh, Abhidharma Samuchaya, Compendium of Knowledge, refers to malice toward three, the three phenomena in the context of explaining anger, and when the cause of harm abides nearby, and taking up weapons and so forth, in the context of explaining belligerence. So belligerence is ready to grab what it, whatever is nearby as a weapon. Vasubandhu's discussion of the five aggregates, which I've referred to a couple of times, Art Engels translated that, that you can find on Amazon, very good book. Uh, he says, malice towards sentient beings in the context of anger and abides in causing immediate harm in the context of explaining the secondary affliction belligerence. Therefore, having contemplated the presentations in these texts of Asanga and his brother Basubandhu, remember they were, they were brothers, uh, you may wonder whether they are just as they have been explained above. However, since they are very difficult to realize, the intelligent should anal intelligent ones, those who are intelligent, should analyze them in detail further. 
it is simply to be understood that anger acts as a support for harming others. Doris. Thank you, Venerable. I like the word wrath better than belligerence. So <laughs> wrath. Yeah. Is, does it always come with um, like a conceptual thought or can it happen with like on impulse, like before you know it, like bam. Yeah, I think I think it can be, uh, you know, sort of because of the intensity, getting familiar with that, and not having it, not having um, applied antidotes in the past, then that can arise very quickly. You, you know, you you see and you hear about people taking a knife or you know, uh, taking a bottle in the bar and hitting someone on the head, just, you know, they've just been slighted slightly, uh, possibly because they're a little bit inebriated. And so that wrath, there's no countervening uh, hesitancy. There's no shame, embarrassment, or conscientiousness uh, that prevents you from doing that. So it, it doesn't have to be something that you contemplate about. It can be something that is just kind of innate. Like habitual, like you've done it so yeah. often that that's your reaction. Yeah, like the Dalai Lama has said uh, when we're talking to Richard Gere about anger, uh, you know, Richard Gere would say that you have to take on the persona of being anger, angry. And the Dalai Lama says, well, be careful because you're rehearsing, you're rehearsing anger, you're leaving an imprint in the mind, even acting that out a little bit. Bob, you, what, what were you thinking? Yeah, uh, I was just reading a footnote to an Artemis Engels book, which I thought was interesting. Uh, there was a, I don't know, a famous person named Buton. I think he did some histories of Buddhism. But anyway, yeah. uh, he did a commentary to the Abhidharma Samachaya, uh, this section, summarizing the action of anger, <clears throat> which is the thing uh, Artemis Engels translates this again as anger instead of belligerence. But anyway, he summarizes this topic as meaning initiating all manner of harm to a person's body, life, or wealth. So initiating all manner of harm to a person's body, life, or wealth is how he thought of what this term meant. Right. Bhutan. So Bhutan Rinpoche was the it was a great person who compiled the Tripitaka. Uh, in Buddhism, what we call the Kangyur and Tengyur. Um, you know, before Lama Tsongkhapa, I don't know if they overlapped. So was also a great scholar of the Kala Chakra and many other things. And he, as you say, he wrote, it was attributed certain histories of Tibet and uh, non-Buddhist thoughts before him, Bhutan. Okay. Make sense so far? So we've got anger as a root delusion and wrath or belligerence, however you like to translate or <laughs> other ways as uh, secondary. That doesn't mean it's less, sometimes it creates more negative karma. So secondary doesn't mean that it's not as virulent as anger. anger. So then the next one, resentment, uh, kondu zimba. You could say holding a grudge. Kon, 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 zimba means holding. Kondu zimba. You see in your text in the parentheses after the word resentment. Zimba, we, we would say in English, holding a grudge, right? Or resentment. I'm not sure how other people, sometimes where they also call it vengeance. Vengeance, you know, holding, you know. What is resentment what is holding a grudge what is what is vengeance it is a refusal to let go of thoughts of harm following that belligerence so it's as a result of of belligerence you know wanting to do something but not giving up on that maybe in the present time you know like the school teacher has scolded you and you get angry and then you want to do something, but you can't do it because you're going to be punished. 
So you hold on to that and you want to get your revenge or vengeance later. What's the famous thing? Again, one of these things that, that I hear, this is supposedly attributed to some Chinese wisdom. Revenge is a dish best served cold or something like that. Have you heard that expression? I've heard it in Star Trek. I just Star Trek. Dish best served cold. <laughs> Nadine, have you heard that? It, maybe in German, it doesn't translate. In other words, uh, if you want to get revenge, better not do it right away. Wait until they're not aware of, of that. So what is resentment, revenge, or vengeance, or holding a grudge? It is a refusal to let go of thoughts of harm following that belligerence and is involved with anger. It has the function of acting as a support for intolerance. So do you ever notice that in your own mind? You know, we, 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 if you're honest, maybe we, you know, we hold a grudge and, you know, we may not immediately plan to do something about it, but if the opportunity arises, we're happy to, you know, we're happy to uh, say something bad about the person or uh, get our digs in later. Yeah. As been said above, it is a mind that refusing to let go of a continuum of anger wishes to harm or retaliate. You can call it maybe retaliation. It is simply to be understood that resentment acts as a support for intolerance. In regard to these two mental factors, the precious garland, Ratnavala, says in verse 5-3, belligerence is a disturbance of mind. Tagging along behind that is resentment. Tagging along. So it sort of follows belligerence or follows uh, wrath. Okay. Now there's some others associ associated with anger, but the next one in this list is concealment, chaba. So if you ever recite some of the um, confession prayers, uh, concealment, you know, comes in as a, at the end, you say, I will, I reveal, I confess, I will not conceal, you know, and, and so forth. Concealment here from the Abhidharma Samachaya says, what is concealment? It is a, hide, a hiding of misdeeds when one is justly accused and is involved with ignorance. It has the function, function of acting as a support for not abiding in contact with regret. Here we go, not abiding in contact. <laughs> if you remember, we were talking about earlier. It has the function of, of acting as a support for not abiding in contact with regret. So it prevents you from being re regretful because you're trying to conceal something. You've done something wrong. Uh, and assumption here that one is just justifiably accused of it. And one tries to hide what you did. Sounds like a lot like what's happening in, in politics. Again, you know, if you follow politics, people trying to conceal the thing where someone wants to, to now to invoke the Fifth Amendment and so forth in America. Medine or some of the other people in other countries may not know what's going on here. You know, concealment. As been said above, is it is an awareness that wishes to hide faults through the force of ignorance when another person, such as a spiritual guide, benignly, kindly points out one's faults. Refusing to accept one's own faults, this concealment causes even small faults to greatly increase because you don't you, you, you want to hide them you don't and therefore you don't regret them it serves as a cause of not abiding in contact with regret for one's faults and not abiding in contact with happiness and has the function of impelling one into the lower re, into lower rebirths in future lives So 
what was this called? This is called concealment. So in Geshe Rapton's book, Concealment, the third one is spite because he puts it in the order of, um, in a different order, those connected with, with anger, first of all. So concealment in Geshe Rapton's book comes a couple pages later, uh, deriving from bewilderment, from ignorance. Concealment is a mental factor that wishes to hide one's unwholesome qualities whenever another person with a benevolent intention, free from either an unwholesome aspiration, bewilderment, hatred, or fear. So the other person is, is not trying to retaliate against you by pointing something out. Talks about such negative qualities that one has. It has the direct function of causing regrets and indirect function of not allowing the body and mind to remain at ease. Here it says it has the direct function of causing regret, but our, our, our text says it has, uh, it serves as a cause of not abiding in contact with regret. So that's something I'll, I'll, I will check on that. This occurs when someone genuinely tries to help us by pointing out certain shortcomings that we may have. What is it called in the West now? If someone is the alcoholic and the family members come together, intervention, maybe an intervention with kind heart, right? Pointing out certain shortcomings we may have. Instead of paying heed to his words, their words, we ignore them and immediately try to forget about what the person has said. In concealment, we do not necessarily react violently or negatively to the other person. We simply suppress any manifestation or knowledge of the fault he is describing. Superficially, it seems as an act of defense, but more the more we resort to it, the more it causes heaviness and discomfort in the mind. So in the Confession Sutras, when it says, I will not conceal, that means you know that I will not... Uh, pretend that these things don't exist, concealment. That finishes that, right? Refusing to accept one's faults is conceal concealment causes even small faults to greatly increase. It serves as a cause of not abiding in contact with regret for one's faults and with happiness, not, not abiding in contact with happiness and has a function of impelling one into lower realms. Okay. So then spite, this one is again, so the first two, belligerence and wrath, whatever, or, or uh, vengeance were associated with anger, then concealment with associated with ignorance. Now again, associated with anger, spite, tsikpa, which sik usually means word. Tsikpa is a verb. What is spite? It is a malicious mind that is preceded by belligerence and resentment and is involved with anger. It has the function of acting as a support for rough, violent speech to increase that which is not meritorious and not abiding in contact with happiness. So when we say someone is spiteful, what does that mean generally? Do you, do you, what would you say, uh, Karen? Do you ever use, you know, if you say someone's spiteful? Um, yes, they, it really is trying to get back at somebody on purpose. You know, you purposefully try to, you know, call them out or get back at them. Right. So I, I'm not sure if spite would be used in the West uh, to include physical things, but here, this one spite, or if we can find a better word, maybe someone can think of a better word, refers to wanting to say, uh, you know, to use ver uh, verbs, <laughs> use verbal means to, you know, put them down, you know, ah, your mother wears galoshes or something like that, you know, or or something worse, you know, you know, like I think one of our politicians that was president not too recently, just recently was uh, known to be very spiteful to say something 
demeaning to everyone, little Marco or, you know, little, you know, something like this. So that's, that's spite. Can you think of another word? What's, what's, Bob, do you have a, another uh, word that might be used there? Uh, here he just translates uh, uh, malice. Malice, okay. But this is particularly with respect to, to speech. As been said above, it is an awareness which, for instance, lacking thoughts of regret and lacking thoughts of admission when other points out when another points out one's faults, it wishes to utter harsh speech are out of hateful thoughts driven by belligerence and resentment. So it's almost like, uh, res well, resentment means that you're holding on to the belligerence. Belligerence is ready to strike out. Re remember, if there's some physical means nearby, uh, vengeance was a thought that keeps it in the in the depth of your heart not going to forget that that you've been harmed and here spite is drives one to say something harsh as a result of them regarding this a discussion in vasubandhu's five aggregates which we've been quoting a couple of times and bob has a copy there in front of him it says hurting with rough words, explaining it as a refusal to, to let go due to adhering to, to misdeeds. The precious garland says, spite is adherence to misdeeds. So almost there, it doesn't sound like it's necessarily speech. However, Vasubandhu's explanation in the Abhidharma Kosha, the treasury of knowledge, uh, in the self-commentary to that, the the uh, the basha, the self-commentary, explain not in the root verses, but it explains spite to be a tight holding to misdeeds, and that it arises from a conception of a bad view of supreme, a bad view as supreme. Due to it, one engages in many faulty actions, such as harsh speech. And by producing many non-meritorious actions, one will not abide in contact with happiness in this life and unpleasant fruition will be produced in future lives. So it, there it doesn't sound like it's, it's their explanations that it's exclusively uh, verbal. And so even the word spite in English almost sounds like it can include, you know, other retaliatory, retaliatory means. Christine, what do you think? Oh, well, I have a question. Thank you, Venable yeah. Dirk. So yeah. um, if I, if, if my question is, if one is in this state of mind, but has enough wherewithal to be like wood and say nothing. Oh yeah, right. So then does that just lessen the karma? I mean, does, is the fact that it exists in the mind and that, that thoughts are there, that's the bad karma, and then it just gets worse if we say it? Or if we say nothing, then what's that about? Do you know what, what she's referring to? Some of the advice when uh, you know negative thoughts come to become like wood. I mean, it's just like, don't think about it. You know, just like like a tree, you know, where the wind blows, the tree bends <laughs> and it'll come back. It's, it's not reacting. It's not like holding sturdily, in which case it'll, maybe the wind will cause it to, to crack or something like that. Another advice when, uh, that Kepsi Trichang Ripache used to give when the mind becomes, you know, under the influence of strong delusions, not necessarily only anger, but also attachment, is to go to sleep. You know, that, no, don't think about it. Just maybe lay down, and uh, if if you go to if you <laughs> the, the the idea here is if you go to sleep, uh, in that state you're not revisiting the situation and using inappropriate attention, thinking he did this, he did that, they did that, or that's so beautiful, I would need to have it. 
you, you know, your mind can calm down. And then when you awake and you're not so caught up in the situation, you can re uh, apply the antidotes. But that's, that's kind of the sense of being like a tree. Uh, just don't let your mind engage in inappropriate attention. Does it make sense, Christine? Yes, but my question was, so the, we create the karma, if, we, if our mind's already there, then we're creating karmic seeds, right? I mean, that's already happening. However, if we are able to mitigate it with one of these antidotes, then it just lessens the karma, right? Well, if you apply the karma. antidote, when you notice, so what, what you have to do is using introspection all the time, like, like in the right. eight verses, vigilant of my mind stream throughout all actions. Whenever delusions begin to arise that may endanger myself and others, may I confront and avert them without delay. So before they become prominent, okay, you have to you have to be aware. Oh, I'm getting a little bit irritated here. Okay, and then apply the antidotes. Then, okay, once the thing is already in your mind, it's it's difficult to apply the antidote. It's right. still possible. It's not right, too right. late. But once it's in the mind and full fledged, you are creating some mental karma. But if you don't allow yourself to express that in body or speech, you know, picking up a weapon or saying harsh words, that's at least that's at least a, a place you could retreat to. You know. Okay. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Venerable. Um, in the section or resentment, the use of the word intolerance there, like I can think of at least two ways to use that word, having a low tolerance level for things going not your way. Right. And another would be intolerant towards a view or a person. Is there a specific meaning to intolerance here? It means not being able to bear, not being able to be patient with something intolerant so uh, i think it again the two ways that you're meaning it that you said it could mean i think they're related it means if you're intolerant that means in general that you can't bear something you can't you know like it's intolerant you're intolerant to the existence of uh, migrants in your community or something like that you can't bear that you know it, it causes you discomfort and then becomes a cause of uh, anger and belligerence and and so forth okay thank you <clears throat> so just i've already gone over but be, maybe if this is edited we'll have another minute so i'm just going to introduce the next one jealousy which some sometimes people think is one of the root delusions because in tantra you know, of the different chakras, you associate ignorance with the crown chakra, uh, attachment with the throat chakra, anger with the uh, with the heart chakra, miserliness or pride, both of them with the navel chakra, and jealousy with the uh, lower chakra. So, of the five chakras, you would you would think that jealousy is one of the the root delusions, but here it's it's not, it's a secondary delusion, secondary affliction. Uh, Abhidharma Samuchaya says, what is jealousy? It is a deep disturbance of mind that cannot tolerate another's marvelous attributes, you know, anything good that another person has, due to excessive attachment to gain and honor, and is involved with hatred. It has the function of causing mental unhappiness and not abiding in contact with happiness. As uh, then Kachin Yeshi Gelson's commentary says, as is said above, it is a deep disturbance of mind that cannot bear another's success due to attachment to gain and honor. It produces serious undesirable consequences in both this and future worlds, other uh, rebirths, future rebirths, in this life, there will be mental unhappiness and in future lives, one is will be impelled into the bad migrations. So question, uh, if your, your boyfriend or girlfriend is flirting with someone else and you find that, you know, you get, what, what, usually we call that jealousy, right? Who are you, what are, what are you jealous of? 
if you use this as the, the meaning of jealousy. Here it says, it's a, a deep disturbance of mind that cannot tolerate another's are marvelous attributes. So that's not your, is that it, you're jealous of your companion, your boyfriend or girlfriend, because they're so attractive to the other person? Or are you jealous of the other person? What does it mean in, in common parlance when you say you're jealous? Donnie, you seem to be in the world. What, 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 what do you say? I'm not saying you're a worldly person, but you seem to be. You know. Some kind of avarice or covetousness of what the other person has, or it's a, it's a type of greed. Well, we can have jealousy of other people's qualities, right? We could be jealous that they have more fame than us and they have more honor. Uh, but when, in common parlance, don't we say, I'm, you know, when your partner, you, you know, someone very close to you that you like is attracted to someone else, spends more time with others, that you feel jealous? What are you feeling jealous about? Are you feeling jealous of the your companion or jealous of the other person or the, the interaction? What? Okay, that's a question we can leave for next time because I said we're, we're here at the end. So think about that. Go back over uh, this one, see if you can find some other definitions of this. So thanks for your patience. Uh, we've got one more class next week. Hopefully, hopefully we'll finish. So let's dedicate the virtue we've created. At the beginning, we spent some time trying to trying to generate bodhicitta, even with effort. You know, this was called uh, not spontaneous bodhicitta, which maybe some of you have, but maybe not, but actually generating bodhicitta with effort, thinking I'm going to listen to this class participate in order to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. So we've created an immense amount of virtuous karma, maybe more than most people create in their entire lifetimes. Let's dedicate that by making a firm determination that it not ripen in some fruitless experience of transitory happiness in the future, but that in whatever way it ripens, may it become the cause of my continued spiritual development from life to life, up to and including enlightenment. Due to these merits, may I quickly become an omniscient Buddha a guru Buddha in order to lead and to lead as a result of that, to lead each and every sentient being into that very same state effortlessly, spontaneously and without error. You can dedicate the merits that you've created in the past, those that we've created now, those in the future again and again toward this goal. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>